Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to February's Megalithic Tours update. Now, February is very much like January this year because the tours are only starting now. So they're, they're basically there. They're, it's, it's filling slowly. So if you want to... Um, if you want to book on a tour or find any information, it's all on the website. But the main thing this this month is our new book. It's called Boranger Sonia, Priest Wizard of Renless Chateau. And uh, Thomas and myself have brought this book out, our latest book. It's something that's meant a lot to me for a long time. And um, basically, the land of Renless Chateau around Renla Chateau is a beautiful, beautiful place. And it's not just that area, but we'll get into it. But uh, Thomas and myself went over there last year, didn't we? Had a bit of a break. What did you think of the area? Oh, it's absolutely a magnificent part of the world. It's definitely a special place. I had long wanted to go to Cathar country and the land de rock and I uh, was long aware of all the mysteries. And it, it, it actually su surpassed my expectations in terms of its kind of like a uh, hauntological gravitas it was it, it was there in spades it re i felt like i was back in a different century it didn't even feel that well especially like in Ale laban that was like it might as well have been the middle ages that village hasn't changed at all and um it was a uh, it definitely i i'd always been interested in the mysteries of that landscape but I, I, it's not until like yourself when you until you absorb yourself into it that you fully fully realize that there's a reason for it, and uh, you know it was it, it became intoxicating after the first day. I was intoxicated with the place in in a good way. Yeah, it takes you over, doesn't it? I mean, you're sitting in the gardens, and uh, this is this is on uh, this is the Cathar tour, by the way. That's where uh, we, we visit Renly Chateau. Uh, so it's part of the Cathar tour, but sitting in the the old Bishop's Palace Hotel gardens, um, it, it is it, it's it's an old medieval walled town, and really, really, really quiet, and that's one of the mysteries. But you do feel like you've just fallen back through the centuries, and you're part of it. And then to realise as well that the very place that you are sitting after dinner, or even having your dinner, depending on the weather, um, people of um, a spiritual intellect in the past would have sat on that very same spot uh, 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 bringing things like the Kabbalah into existence and there would have been so many as you, as you sit there and, and have conversations about sort of spiritual matters that has been happening in that very same place by some massive minds going back centuries it, and you just you just you do you flow into it, don't you? And you can feel it. Yeah, we were sitting under a large chestnut tree, and behind us, behind me, was the basically all the houses with the where Kabbalah was developed. And uh, like you said, you could have taken that conversation back when we were brain brainstorming each night and fleshing out our own theory. Uh, you could have taken us back eight hundred years, and the language would have changed. But we would have been talking to Cathar prefects and, um, you know, enlightened uh, Catholic types and as well as Kabbalists. And it would have been the same conversations. There's something, Kabbalah did not happen there by accident. It's something in that area uh, caused that a uh, spark to happen. Yeah, it's because the, that large Jewish community that was there. And it's as you travel around, uh, Al-Aliban seems like a centre of it in some way. Uh, but yeah, and but as you travel around the different areas, it, it's all the same. It, but it seems to be centered on Alet Leban, and uh, that is a mystery. Um, but the there's, the mystery there's that a sense of, there's a sense of destiny about that town, about that village. You notice that it's it, it's almost exists to bring minds together. Yeah, 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 and to keep away things that will pollute, like a central yeah. a central sell a theme it's as if somebody's protecting something in that town that isn't that because as we say in the book all the other little towns like there's um there's lamu and Quizer and quillon and all the different towns round about busy sort of metropolitan type areas london but in al-at-laban quiet 
yes it was, it was very strange and it's not economically depressed it's just that they want to keep it that way it's so it's like a it's like a magic circle the town is a magic circle by itself and only the ones who are adept enough to enter it can enter it that's what it feels to me yeah absolutely but the actual mystery that we um faced and decided to solve was the one of, that we all know about from Renly Chateau and so it's dating back to 1885 when a priest the famous priest Boranger Saunier uh, was first posted there. I mean, it's a massive story, but this is the nitty gritty of it. So Saunier was based um, at Rennes Chateau, and he arrived, and the place was just in rock and ruin. The church was falling down. The place was just a mess. And within a very short period of time, he found some documents, went off to to the central piece in Paris. Uh, met some uh, esoteric uh, organizations and secret societies, and the people from San and the the priests from San Sol Peace who were, I would imagine, in that sort of direction anyway. And within no time, he was a multi multi millionaire, and spent the equivalent of multi millions of pounds. Uh, so the question is, where did he get his money from? And that that is the question, which has come down through time and has never been answered. It's never been answered because of what... Now, um, we're not saying it isn't true, but we're saying the dominance of the Mary Magdalene, Magdalene blood line, Jesus Christ bloodline thing, has generated a sense of suffocation that all of her theories regarding Ren Le Chateau and Saunier have been smothered out. And we have probably created the most original interpretation of this mystery surrounding his accumulation of wealth. Although when you start thinking about it, it's quite obvious why it happened too. Uh, but uh, we're not saying that the, the Magdalene Jesus bloodline story is a myth or a distraction or a psyop. It's, it's a story. It still stands. However, it has been amplified by vested interests who deliberately did this in order to stop any other line of investigation, which included the line of investigation myself and Neil had have unleashed. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if I was to ask anybody, how did Sonia become massively rich? Where did his wealth come from? And you say, well, because Jesus got married 2,000 years ago. I don't really answer the question, does it? It even doesn't even, does it even approach the question. Yeah, it seems to have worked. People say, well, don't ask that. Look over here. And everybody has looked over there. And, I, and I've been, so I went down first, it must be two decades ago now. My first impression was, uh, God, this is just like, um, like a church, but also like a Rossi Crucian place. You know, it's like, uh, that, that's what the first thing that came into my mind. But nobody over all those years I've been doing two is there every year, sometimes more than one, two every year, for all those years, nearly 20 years, and nobody has ever attempted to answer the fundamental question. So if they have, if they have, they say things like Sonia found a bunch of money under the altar, a load of gold, and he sold it, or that kind of thing. But that doesn't explain the vast numbers of checks sent by the Habsburg Bank. Uh, that doesn't explain how, you know, uh, you know, you know, if, if he found the gold, he just would have sold it. If he had a found, he did. It wasn't, you know, it, it, he, it, Manil and I believe that he was basically working as a contractor for the European royal families. Yeah. Well, we found um, out, didn't we, for definite, uh, and we we wormed into the royal connection, and there were there is a massive, massive royal connection to the. The two main royal families—that's the Habsburgs and the and the and the kings, the royalty of France—and he was he was in there like that. He and, and that's a fact. And uh, he was their boy. They loved him. They they bigged him up. He was he was like Willy Wonka had found. You know, he was like Charlie had found the, the golden ticket. He yeah, he had. They, they were they were like this is the man we. He was almost like a Christ-like figure to them. He was the one that they were waiting for. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they were going to do everything they could, regardless of expense, to unleash and develop what they wanted from him, which we will reveal in the book. Yeah. Now, the Habsburg Blanchfort family, they were the, the royals or the lords of Rennes le Chateau itself. Um, now, they had a secret, a royal secret. And that secret got lost, mainly because, uh, I mean, we don't want to go into too many details here, but um, I know. Sorry, I got a little message there. Yeah. But he got lost. He got um, buried in the church by a previous priest. Because what the, chateau, the, the church at Renly Chateau used to be uh, just a family chapel for the Blanchfort Blanch, so Blanch family. But they lost their secret because it was hidden by the previous priest who had to run and flee the revolution. So that was a, that secret was so powerful that they had to retrieve it. So they they found an agent to retrieve that secret, and the agent was Sonia. And so he was basically, we're saying, he's working as, as a royal agent. Exactly. And the Mary Magdalene thing came about as the name of the church. The church is called the Holy Church of Mary Magdalene. And so people automatically assume that this is the, the central focus of it. But there's hundreds of churches dedicated to Mary Magdalene all over France, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, and even in England as well. So it's not, it, it wasn't unique to that. There was something else, you know, and people focused in on the sort of like the branding, Mary Magdalene. And that became the only story, the only game in town despite these enormous contradictions and anomalies that were inside and around that church uh, that yeah. people have just looked at in bewilderment. But in our book, we'd actually show that they're central to the whole story and not just superfluous oddities. Yeah, but there's other things that they said, like he was writing, uh, it was it was being paid to do masses and uh, for people and all that sort of thing. And, but it, it, that's been, that was all added up by a guy called Jean-Luc Robin, who took over Sonia's domain. And it, it's like saying um, you could buy ICI off the back of a paper round. You know, it's just, it's so ridiculous. It, it, he did do that sort of thing, but it's so ridiculous. But what's, yeah. when, as soon as he finished his, uh, when he got his, his sort of domain that he built, which was huge, it really was quite a big place, he had visitors from all over Europe, and we had uh, celebrate uh, feast days with big long uh, list of meats and on, like entrees, like thirty entrees. And <clears throat> he had basically the life of a, a superstar. They were spectacular menus, uh, incredibly opulent. Uh, but they serve a spiritual purpose, which mm. people would look at that and say, "What?" Uh, but we will reveal what they what that mm. was for in the in the book. Now, remember, people see the Magdalen tours, the little castle with the tower he built overlooking the valley towards the Pyrenees, and the beautiful orangery and the garden and everything there, as uh, just like the 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 lavish spendings of a priest who came into the money and made the place look beautiful. No, he built a pagan temple, and we will reveal what that pagan temple was about and who it was devoted to, and why it was so important for that to happen. Uh, because it was, there's a, there, there's, uh, there's a, a, you know, there's a longing, a longing by these European elites to get back to the, the old ways, the, the old powers of the, of the ancestors. And they know that if something happened when Christianity took over the Roman Empire, that a certain esoteric and occult aspect to life before the empire, before the conversion of Constantine existed among the nobles, they had magical powers. And uh, what better, you know, what better way to restore these than to have a temple, at least one. And we have, you know, this is what the, the Rex Diaz families that you've often talked about, Neil, and these people knew exactly what Saunier could deliver for them. And it yeah. most certainly wasn't Mary Magdalene and the Jesus bloodline. 
No, I mean, it's difficult to know how far to go without giving the game away, but um, it really is. It's a, it's a wow factor. But not only that, when you, um, when you sort of realise what the answer is, it is absolutely obvious, really. It was, it was just, it wasn't it? Well, of course it was. And I think we can't, we knew that, didn't we? And I remember that I wish I was talking to Gary Daisy the other day, uh, and I talked about that time when we were waiting. I was waiting for you downstairs for dinner, and you turned up and you said, "You don't believe what I found," and you'd found something in a very old document, which just, well, that's it, proof. Yeah, it was the it was the solidified thing to put it together, and it was only true. Well, you see, it, it, my in my own book, sorcery, I had written a section in that book on on how espionage is intrinsically linked with occult, and always has been. Yeah, uh, Majesty's Secret Service is really secret and in the occult sense too, mm-hmm. and so. It was that was almost my research into that book. John D. John D, but I go even people that. like Ian Fleming and mm-hmm. Dennis Wheatley and things like the London's the London's Operation Group and things like that during the war, and you have the connections with the the Third Reich occult, which I covered in with Al Purgus night. Well, that never went away. That's always been there, and part of the the ruse was to create a distraction in a, in the true meaning of the word occult hidden, in order to keep them looking over here when the, the real thing was over there. So it was then it started to dawn on me that the Ren Le Chau mis- Chateau Mysteries had an espionage occult yeah, element yeah. that went right down to Dan Brown and all the stuff and answered all those strange mysteries about murders and even that experience that we had at the site of the Poussin painting. Oh, where yes. this, this guy came up in the car and you know he, he looked like he looked like he was secret service or something like that the look on his face and uh, that was a quite an emotional moment for me because i'd always wanted to be at the spot i'm a, I'm a great admirer of, of his paintings and to be at the spot where that famous painting the shepherds of arcadia was painted and to look at the rock where that megalith used to be it was very emotional moment for me and then you came along and then this guy comes along and he's like, he basically, I was waiting for him to pull a gun out or something. That's just what I was thinking, yeah. 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 I mean, that guy was, it was menacing, wasn't he? I mean, you're talking about a beautiful bit of countryside with huge mountains, nothing really going on there at all. Yeah, whenever I've been there, there's always been, it's as if this, they're there to keep you away from it. Uh, I can't understand why. I don't know why. But it, as you as you look over, you can see the old um, where the old tomb used to be, and the Renner Chateau in the distance, just on a hill next to it, like a hill where a hill jots out on the side of the mountain, and it, it's it, it's clear it, it's there. But um, yeah. that guy, yeah, he, I mean, on that day, he, he was really menacing. I was parked on the side of the road, and he was like walking past and looking in. And I thought, you know, we're gonna this is gonna be trouble, but. Luckily, Woody walked right down a path into the into the countryside. Yeah, it was like we were big tailed or something. Yeah. And uh, that's another thing too. I mean, uh, this whole this whole thing, you know, this whole this whole thing of uh, connecting the 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 royals and secret service espionage to these stories. You know, Poussin was sent down there to do, or, or probably didn't even paint that. He may have not have painted it, may have not been there. I mean, he painted that painting to say what he was hearing in the royal circles in Paris that down there in the Land of Rock, or the you know, it is, is the answer. What we've lost is down there mm-hmm. somewhere in the Rennes Chateau region. It's somewhere what we're after. And it really, we need to create this Arcadia in the south of France. And there was that letter uh, from the superintendent of to the superintendent of finances from, uh, but it was all to do with the painting. I can't remember the actual people it was. It's gone out of my head. But um, that letter was saying there's something here that is of so great importance that even kings would never um, have such great and if you uh, a great import. And if you were to have this, 
you would have riches beyond all compare and uh, nothing in this world could ever meet it. And that's all tied in with it, isn't it? Uh, so there was yeah. a secret. Wherever, whichever area you go, there's this same secret that they're trying to recover. And also we know that Saunier, when his first trip to Paris, went to see the Shepherds of Arcadia in the Louvre. Mm. Uh, so the Poussin painting was literally a, a blueprint to a great secret. And that was covered in both the brown, you know, the Holy Blood, Holy Grail and the, the, the Dan Brown stuff. But again, it's like you said early on, what does a parish priest getting lots of money have to do with the bloodline of Jesus? The same thing. What does this mysterious uh, anomaly in the shadow of the Pyrenees appearing in a famous painting got to do with that also? Again, they 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 it's classic occult. We're given a snippet of what's true and then told, but mm. it's really and they're the old occult secret society way of if they're if they want if they think something's going to become uh, found out, they will come out and and they will give a whole explanation uh, to deviate you away and move you into basically what the prairie of zion did um yeah. moved everybody away from the initial question into something totally different and then discredit discredit themselves and disappear it, it, again into into um it bears an uncanny resemblance to something that happened in britain during exactly the same period as when the whole Priory of Zion, Syop, we'll call it, you know, well, distraction, you know, maybe was cultivated in the post war period. We had the same situation in England where Crowley and Gardner sat down, knowing that the English witchcraft laws were coming to yeah. an end. They invented Wicca so people could play with the yeah, yeah, yeah. cosplay magic rather than mm. entering into Thelema or some group like that. They were doing the real stuff. It was it was funny how it was the same period, and it used yeah. the the same way. Yeah, it's a method that they they use all the time. You look over here, don't look over there. It's so it's yeah. all brainwash. It's it's a type of um, yeah, it, 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 hypnosis. It, yeah, I mean the whole the whole thing about that area is well, we see Renly Chateau now as this tiny place with you know, between eighteen and hundred people, and uh, it's tiny. But once upon a time, that was actually a city of 30,000 people. That could, It's amazing to believe it, isn't it? You can yeah. still see when you stand on the top of the of the, the rampart, well, not the rampart, it's on Sonia's uh, platform that he built. You can see that the outer line and, and, um, and uh, towers and things. Now, that was because the Visigoths basically used Renly Chateau as... Uh, Fort Knox, they had all their wealth there, and this is all tied up with you know, when they uh, attacked Rome, um, the, all the, the wealth of Rome, because they finally, uh, they, they, they were the first people to uh, bring down the Roman Empire, weren't they? So they took all the wealth of Rome, uh, and it's thought that that wealth of Rome w was included the the the, whatever it was that was hidden underneath the Temple Mount. Uh, so everything is always tied in uh, with um, with these Rex Deus families because they're at the Temple Mount as well, and uh, the, the Knights Templar. Now, the Knights Templar thing is another fascinating thing because they were the first people to... They were the people that went to the Holy Land and dug underneath the Temple Mount for nine years uh, whatever they recovered they kept now then also Renly Chateau in that area was the homeland was going to be the designated homeland of the Knights Templar they were they actually were making plans to make this their own land Templar Templar country and Bertrand de Blanc for 30 percent of the wealth of the Templars was in that area as well. Um, and then there's all sorts of things that tie in with it. Um, Bertram de Blanchefort was uh, of the Hatsbury Blanchefort family. So he was in, he was the Lord of Red, Red the Chateau. And he was 
the Grand Master of the Knights Templar for 13 or 16 years. So everything ties together with, um, it keeps coming back, the wealth keeps coming back. And it's all tied in with the Knights Templars, with these Rex Day's families, and and with this, whatever the secret was. But I, I even, I mean, jokingly now, I, well, it's not even jokingly, but you say, that, Ren the Chateau should really be a little backwater with with nothing happening, because it's like millions of other little villages. Yeah, it's still wealthy, isn't it? It's still rich. And it's rich because people are still going to Ren the Chateau. You know, it, it's still it's still massively wealthy. Yeah, it has a spell it, of, a spell about of that area. Mm. I couldn't imagine how much that cafe, that one cafe restaurant brings in. Yeah, and that cafe used to be one of the gardens of Renle Chateau, uh, of, of Sodio's domain. So when you were having your, um, well, I have the the melted camembert out of the real fire with, with Fritz, well, um, we were actually sat where Sonia, Sonia was have been entertaining guests uh, up to the level of royalty and bishops and and you name it. So and it, it makes a fortune. And people people are visiting all year round, visiting around the chateau. Yeah, I couldn't get it around my head that that was once a major urban centre, and it wasn't until I climbed down the side of the hill. Below the Magdalen tours, while you were work, while you were setting up the camera and sound equipment, I went for a little exploration down there, and sure enough, you can see the foundations and what's left of all kinds of buildings that went that went down almost to the bottom of the valley. Yeah. They're just buried in the bush now. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Because literally, eighty to hundred people it used to be up to thirty thousand. I mean, that would yeah. have been a massive uh, Merovingian uh, uh, city. And of course, it's all and it, was, out, and it was like Arcadia because the land around there is so rich and fertile that you could easily support a population with the the agricultural output, no problem. It, it, well, the 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 it was it is a even when you go there, you can see that it there's something. Uh, it's so rich and fertile. Even the bugs are bigger, you know. It's like and more fertile. It's like it, it's like it would have been a, a, a bread basket. Uh, in the Cathar times, when the Cathar lords, um, which again were the, the Knights Temple family, they they were, were uh, it was a very wonderful, peaceful place uh, with the troubadours and that sort of thing. But it was known as a breadbasket, and that was another reason why the northern lords wanted to take it, because, because it was so fertile. All the minerals and uh, nutrients being washed down from the Pyrenees just into those valleys and just, yeah. just full of like uh, agricultural potential, but yet was poor at the time of Sarnier, which I find interesting. Uh, by then, it had gone into de into decline as the Industrial Revolution had moved people away into nearby cities and as far away as Paris. So it went in that classic, you know, Industrial Revolution era decline when he started taking over the parish. And uh, he, he didn't, yeah, he didn't have the money. Yeah, no, he didn't have the money because he had to pay from his own stipend to, to repair the roof. And it just basically had to beg for money. And then during this, the famous rev uh, the famous renovations under the altar, suddenly he's off to Paris and he's the golden boy of the aristocracy. Well, yeah, and he got, um, because he was royalist and... You know, the royalists at, the, at this particular revol uh, revol revol revolutionary time, because there was more than one. The first one was where they lost uh, the secret. And the second one was around Sonia's time. And he got sacked, basically, for doing uh, giving a, a pro-royalty speech. And he got sent off to Nabon. And in yeah. Nabon, he, he met Albert, his brother, he, who visited him a lot. He was also a priest. But he was very well in with the top royals. And he was sent back to Renle Chateau with something like two thousand francs, with a, a fortune really then, and yeah. uh, from one of the from royalty, so royalty pulled cords, whatever it was, to get him sent back, and he sent him back with a lot of money. So he was sent back basically with, um, with a, a job to do, wasn't he? And none of this 
absolutely zero of this can be related back to the Mary Magdalene Jesus bloodline. Nothing to other do than a, a phenomenal, a fantastical rules has been create, created. And like I said, like we I say in the book, and there's no more evidence to connect any of this to the survival of the Jesus bloodline than there is to ancient aliens. In fact, it may yeah. have even been ancient aliens of its time. Yeah, well, it is, yeah. I mean, the lucky thing is that we have our background and what we've done in the past and what we've learned and been part of. It, it takes that to be able to recognise the signs. I think of it. It's yeah. luckily that, it's, it, that we... Um, we just have that knowledge yeah. that we've built up over our lives that to look and we can look at it from that perspective and we can see the signs and see what's um, what what's what's on show and recognize what it is. Yeah, I just went in there with my occultic mind, and that's mm. when it came out. Uh, and and that's the problem with Rena Chateau. Nobody from no, we're probably the first two fellas with a, a background in occult and esotericism to go in with sort of like clean eyes mm -hmm. and like you said it was obvious what the answer was but the ruse and distraction was so colossal it, it you know like the obvious thing ancient megaliths right it's obvious there was ancient technology high technology in the far off ancient past yeah. so instead of the the establishment being rattled by people finding out that there was a world before the bible you know, which is what we're still basing antiquity on. Yeah, let's yeah, create yeah. let's create the nonsense of ancient aliens mm -hmm. as a ruse from Eric Van Daniken on. Well, they've done this, and again, the the Holy Blood, Holy Grail thing came out at the same time as Van Daniken was creating the uh, la, the, the the gods thing. You know, it's so bizarre how the mm -hmm. the, the, the psyops are kind of similar at the same time. Yeah, as we, if they they were as if it was decided somewhere. Let's yeah. let's put a covering over all this now. Let's well, make sure Alan these Watt things said, don't yeah. come out. And it, it's yeah. the whole thing that, um, which we've said so many times, that the rich and powerful have a way of creating wealth and protecting themselves and and keeping themselves in the position they're in. And they just and they're frightened to death that mere mortals such as us would find out this secret. The one, that always, the one that got me, and even a lot of people, again, they're puzzled, like we're going to talk about the anomalies of the actual church, they're puzzled, bewildered, was that the authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail had took Dan Brown, the author of The Da Vinci Code, to court for plagiarism, mm. right? mm. for plagiarism. And the hilarious thing is, they're both on the same publishing company. Yeah. So no matter yeah. who won or lost, that, that case, the money went back, was just moved from one department to another. No one yeah. was actually, no one lost a penny. Now, well, that, not only that, that, but they made a million, they made billions out of yeah. it. And that court case was set up for no other reason than to keep people focused on the Magdalene bloodline story. Yeah, I, I was I was there, I was part of that whole thing when it was all going on in, in a sort of peripheral sort of way. And I remember Henry Lincoln had nothing to do with it. He was like, he doesn't have anything to do with that, Lord. And he wasn't. It was basically the other two that were doing the court case thing. But um, they were both random house, I think it was. And yep. you were going to a, any large bookshop and there was there were <laughs> cardboard um, stands for books with Da Vinci Code on one side and and Holy Blood, Holy Grail on the other side, together. So one was selling the other. So the sales through that court case must have gone through the room far more than would have ever yeah. cost for the court case, you know. The and and, 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 and it, it solidified and copper-charged the whole theory that they'd, been, they'd come up with about the, the priory of Zion and all that stuff. Yeah, and that, I mean, the, the Magdalene thing is a very, very powerful message that people can't, seem well we don't want to but it nobody wants to look anywhere else once they've taken that on board you know yeah it, it's because there's an, all encompassing there's an intrinsic bizarre i have to say fetish among certain europeans that they long so much to be biblical jews whether they are 
British Israelites going around these islands looking for this the original Holy Land, or they're uh, people who think that Jesus lived in Cornwall or Joseph of Arimathea or, you know, the whole Holy Blood, Holy Grail thing. And it even extends to India, this nonsense that Jesus went to India that the hippies invented. There's a there's a bizarre notion that you have to, it's a powerful spell, a very powerful spell. Very, very powerful. And, and you have these, this, these female cult who are attracted to the whole Mary Magdalene thing and they observe, obs, absorb themselves so deeply into it that they actually, we, we, we met them, they had like the symbols that they yeah. actually think, they think they're some kind of compensatory Mary Magdalene. And what does that mean? They were married to God. Yeah, well, there you go, yeah. Those, it's, that a, that we it's, met. Yeah. It's, like the, it's like with the alien crowd and the star seeds. Yeah, it's it, it, it is. It, it's a whole world. It's and it's all encompassing. So it's yeah. it's just a breath of fresh air to say, no, hang on a minute. Let's just go right back to the beginning and see what was really happening there. You know, and it, yeah. and, it and it there are ways it. Well, so when this it. when this book comes out, if you hear stories of me and Neil being chased down the street by armies of uh, Presbyterian New Age women, uh, you you know why, <laughs> and not for a good reason. <laughs> Gems <will be> <laughs> oh dear, I don't know. Yeah, well, there we go. So let's sum it up, shall we? Um, the book. I'll, I'll by now. I'll, I'll I'll put put it up on the screen here. Uh, but it's out. It's out. Boranger Sonia, Priest Wizard of Renless Chateau. To me, it's the most powerful thing that Thomas and I have have come up with because it really is. Earth. I think for some people it could be earth shattering. I mean, it, the 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 head, this thing, which is just on in as you walk in to um, the church has been smashed three or four times now. Somebody's actually got, gone to the trouble of finding a really quiet time, going up to the church and hitting it, beating it to death with a, a stick so it has to be rebuilt. Why? why? We'll tell we'll, we, we We have explained why. We'll and tell you not, why. And it, and it wasn't just because of blasphemy. And it wasn't? No, absolutely. And... Uh, I put one thing at the back of the book, which kind of sums it up in a way. Um, in her late years, Mary Dunnold, you know that she that Mary Dunnold was Sonia's trusted confidant and and um, housekeeper, whatever else. Uh, so she remained at Randall Chateau when Sonia died. Um, it was taken over by a Noel Carbu, but he he. She would tell people, I know, that uh, they're actually walking on gold. So what she's saying is that the place itself is the mystery. And we'll leave it with that. And the book is out now, you said. We... The book is out now. I've got some copies winding the way to me from the publishers. So you can get them from uh, my website or, or lulu.com. Eventually, they'll be on Amazon, but that takes a couple of weeks for it to filter through. But I've, I've got a chunk coming to me, so um, megalithictours.com. All the tours there are filling up, so please come and join us on a tour. <coughs> and please buy a book. Thanks for listening, and thanks, Thomas, for being here. Yeah, I'll create a Substack page with with this when this video was uploaded with a link and a little a little introduction and spread that around as well. Brilliant. So, back to you all. See you soon. Au revoir.